Thank you. Um, well, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, and I know how much work goes into uh, having guest scholars come and visit, so um, that I appreciate that all the more. And it's lovely to be here in, uh, in a community setting off campus. It's given me some ideas for our own Judaic Studies program and our various um, lecture series that we organize throughout the year. Um, and what other thing? I'm, I'm, I, I always think to myself, I have to thank everyone before I, <laughs> before I start, and I, I'm a little scattered today, probably because I got up very early to leave Portland. So if I think of the other thank yous as I, as I talk, I will continue to, continue to thank. Oh yeah, thank you to the rabbi for, for hosting, for sure. Um, so as, uh, as Natan said, uh, this lecture is based on my book, which came out um, a few years ago. Uh, I think this is actually the first in-person lecture that I've given on this book because it came out just as the epidemic um, descended upon us and so all of my book talks were on Zoom. So it's interesting to be giving it in person. Uh, I expect you all to be in little boxes but actually you're really here which is, which is really, really nice. Um, and so you might have heard or you might have guessed that this particular topic uh, focusing on a magical ritual serves as kind of the bridge between this project, which I finished a few years ago, and the new project that I'm working on now that I'm going to be talking about uh, tomorrow on campus uh, about gender, magic, and folk ritual uh, in European Jewry. So... Uh, just some uh, framing for, for the, the scope of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, when I say the Jews of Eastern Europe, I'm talking about a pretty wide swath of territory, as you can hopefully see here on, on the map. Uh, the, the larger map is a map of the Palo Settlement and the Kingdom of Poland, which were the areas of the the Russian Empire, where Jews, uh, where Jews were permitted to live, uh, were forced to live. The book actually covers a much larger chronological sweep, so I basically go from uh, sometime in the 18th century uh, up to 1939. So we're talking about, in the early modern period, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was the name of, uh, of the Polish polity at the time. And then we're talking about the Russian Empire and the Austrian Empire, subsequently known as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, and the territory that we're talking about there is Galicia, which is essentially southern Poland that was under Austrian rule, which you can see in the, the lower map. And in the interwar period, we're talking about independent Poland again. And to a lesser extent, I discussed the Soviet Union in the book uh, a little bit, but I mostly focus on independent Poland. And so as some of you may be aware, the Jewish population that we're talking about here is uh, the largest in the world uh, for many centuries. Also very, very dense Jewish population. Um, many Jews lived in shtetls, which were essentially market towns where Jews could form anywhere between 35 and 75% of the population. Uh, and this was a very, very dynamic, rich, uh, multifaceted culture, not only, of course, you could say primarily a, a religious culture, but uh, certainly in the late 19th century, it begins to uh, begins to develop other aspects, um, including polit various political cultures, secular cultures, um, and throughout this entire period, even though there are smaller numbers of Jews who gradually begin to acculturate and to speak the languages of their neighbors, whether it be Russian or um, or Polish, um, or in fewer cases, German. Generally, Jews preserve a distinctive way of life throughout this entire period uh, that sets them apart from their Christian neighbors, but there are also many points of, of contact between the two groups. And um, we're not, I'm not gonna talk much about the points of contact 
in the scope of tonight's discussion, but maybe in the question and answer, because I often get asked, well, does the cholera wedding have any parallel in Christian, uh, in the Christian cultures that, uh, that Jews lived um, as part of? And so we could talk about that then. Now, th this book project focused specifically on the outcasts, or sometimes I call them marginalized people or m marginals, because I had a, a hunch very, very, well, a long time ago. This was already uh, in probably uh, 2000, when I first started this project, 2007 or so, 2006, 2007. Uh, and I, I got interested because of some of the work I had done in my book on Kiev. I got interested in the, the lowest, the people on the lowest socioeconomic rung of the ladder in the Jewish community and what we could learn by studying them, by studying their lives, by trying to reconstruct their lives if possible. And so I started exploring all kinds of different possible categories within this larger group. Uh, for example, for a while I was looking into servants because servants were an important category in Jewish, the Jewish kind of occupational um, framework. And in the end, I decided that that, that didn't fit into this particular, um, this particular structure that I was building. But as you can see here from the categories that I've listed on the slide, uh, and again, I can go into this more in the Q&A if that interests people. Ultimately, I uh, settled on three basic groups, and these are beggars and other destitute people, uh, people with various kinds of disabilities, physical, developmental disabilities, and, and um, mentally ill people, and to a lesser extent, poor orphans. Uh, and I chose these categories in large measure because they were treated as one group by the Jewish community at the time. Uh, and, and essentially, all of them were unable, for the most part, to, uh, to survive on their own in, in the world. So they had to have some sort of assistance, some sort of support, either from families, from the Jewish community, uh, by begging for alms. And these are the people who we're going to be discussing today. You'll also it'll become clear soon that in the ritual that I'm discussing tonight, the cholera wedding, um, these categories of people were considered eligible to participate in the cholera wedding. And uh, I'll make clear what I mean by that in, in a few minutes. I've given you a few examples on the screen of photographs that we have from mostly the interwar period of these kinds of people. Uh, these are not unproblematic photos to display. Um, I'm, I do it in large measure because I want to help. Part of the project is to bring these people to the fore and try to understand who they were. Um, the, the, the gaze that was, that was instrumentalized or that was um, mobilized for this particular, these photographic projects were not usually kind. They were not usually uh, in service of helping these people, but rather they were often presented as, especially in the case of newspapers, uh, as you can see here, one of the one of these was uh, taken for the Jewish Daily Forward. They were, in essence, um, curiosities for people to to look at. But in some cases, they were taken by uh, welfare workers. You can see you might be able to see that the photograph on the left was. I found it in the JDC archives, the archives of the Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, which, uh, which operated a very wide uh, welfare network in Eastern Europe in the 20s and 30s. And so in that case, there's some, there may be some question about exactly why it was taken. It may have been for a more charitable purpose. But in any case, the photographs are here. So I'm going to talk about cholera tonight. Um, and just, just a few words about cholera as an illness, uh, because we're, we, we need to understand the, we need to understand the terror that it struck in people's hearts in the 19th century when they heard that a cholera epidemic had begun. Unfortunately, we all also understand to some degree what it means, the, the t what that terror is like when a, when a pandemic strikes. 
Um, but in the case of, and of course, it's also true, I suppose, in the early days of COVID that people were dying very quickly. Uh, that was certainly true for cholera. Um, and often people died within a day or two, sometimes just hours, uh, because it caused such severe, uh, such severe gastrointestinal distress and, and dehydration. And for most of the 19th century, uh, people did not know what caused cholera. And so th therefore they developed all various kinds of explanations and rituals. Of course, one of those we're, we're talking about tonight. Generally, cholera was attributed to miasma, to bad air. Uh, and so there were all kinds of remedies that were, that were um, suggested. Uh, because of the, the sense that certain parts of the city or certain neighborhoods could be more uh, susceptible to this bad air than others. And there were all kinds of other explanations as well. Because it was spread by contaminated, mostly contaminated water, also to some extent food, it was neighborhoods that were poor that were hit hardest. We understand why that was, of course, because they didn't have access to, uh, to clean drinking water and because usually the, the sewage and the, the drinking water systems were mixed. But since people didn't know that at the time, very often there were kind of moralizing explanations advanced for why it was that cholera was, uh, was hitting these particular working class neighborhoods. Often cholera was associated with poverty, uh, with filth, and as you can imagine, there were often accusations made about the people living in these neighborhoods uh, that had to do with their moral character. Sometimes it was even uh, kind of tacked onto ideas about sexual immorality. So in this country, uh, cholera was most often associated with African Americans and with Irish immigrants because those were the neighborhoods that were hit the hardest. In Eastern Europe, it was often, not always, but it was often associated with Jews, especially in the earlier cholera epidemics in the 19th century, Jewish, uh, majority Jewish or heavily Jewish towns were hit very, very hard by cholera. Uh, and Jews did generally tend to live very densely, which is one of the reasons why, why it spread so quickly. Now, I think it's interesting to point out, um, and I, again, this will, I think, become clear when we talk more deeply about the cholera wedding itself, but across the 19th century, in many cases, the working classes, the poor were uh, very mistrustful of medical experts. And because there was really no medical way of treating cholera, people who were taking to the so-called cholera hospitals in many countries were usually presumed to be on their way to death in the next few days, which Usually they were, and so people tried to prevent their relatives from being forcibly taken to these cholera hospitals, which was often the case. Uh, and in some countries, there were even riots uh, that had to do with what was being done with the, uh, with the corpses of the, of the cholera victims, um, or what the police were actually doing with, the, with those who were sick with cholera when they were taken away. And so this, I want you to think about or keep in mind this kind of popular resistance to the, um, to the experts, right? To the expert cures uh, or to the expert, to the policies that government experts and health experts brought to, to the pandemic because I think that will also play a role when we're talking about uh, the cholera wedding in the Jewish community. And of course, as you can imagine, there were, and we don't, you don't have to imagine because we know it happened during our own pandemic that there are many popular remedies uh, for, for the, the, including quack cures, the, the word bleach comes to mind. Um, you know, in that, in that day and age, there was something like a, 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 a ring made out of a palm leaf that you, that you could buy that was, you know, that people said would keep the cholera away. Um, all kinds of, of other magical cures. Very often the magical cures involved the magic circle, which is a really, really central part of magical practice in most cultures. 
So the magical, cir magical circle involves drawing some kind of circle either around a house, around a community. In, two in 2020, Patriarch Kirill of the Russian Orthodox Church circled Moscow in a motorcade. Obviously, he didn't refer to it as a magical circle at the time. He referred to it as a religious ritual that the, the icon that, he was that was in the motorcade would protect uh, Moscow from the from the worst effects of the pandemic, but it's the same idea of the the magical circle. Um, and in some cases, we know that Jewish communities also uh, carried out rituals like this. For example, they would process with Torah scrolls around the community to try to um, to keep the community safe from the uh, the evil that seemed to be descending upon it. Uh, and then there's all kinds of traditional Jewish remedies with which you may be familiar. Uh, and people were encouraged to give more charity. They checked the mezuzahs on their doors to make sure that the parchments were correct so that uh, evil could not uh, make its way through, the, uh, th through any kind of uh, crack that would be, that would be created by um, a, uh, a faulty parchment. Various kinds of amulets. Uh, there were even attempts in some communities to uh, finger people who were known to be or who were suspected of sexual immorality because it was understood or it was suspected that they may uh, be the reason for, um, for the epidemic or for the epidemic coming to their particular community. And then the one that we're discussing tonight, which was in some ways the most dramatic, uh, is the cholera wedding itself. So what is the cholera wedding now that we've come all this way and you, I haven't explained what it is. So the cholera wedding is the marriage of two outcasts of the Jewish community to each other in the cemetery. It probably started out in the early 19th century uh, as the marriage of two orphans. So we see the earlier uh, the earlier sources seem to refer specifically to orphans, and then later in the 19th century, the categories was, was expanded to include all of the people who I spoke about a few minutes ago, who I talk about in my book. So essentially beggars, people with disabilities, uh, people who were known then as town fools, who were sometimes people with local people with either developmental disability, some kind of mental illness, who were known by everyone in the town, and they had a kind of iconic uh, character uh, or iconic place in the town. Uh, and it, there's various aspects in some of the descriptions that we read of the, car, of, the, of the cholera wedding of a carnival or even possibly a freak show, uh, meaning that the, uh, the entire town comes to witness this ritual. Um, very often there's kind of loud carousing, there's drinking of the kind that you, to, to an extent that you might not see at a regular wedding. I should also point out that having a wedding, holding a Jewish wedding in a cemetery is highly unusual. You would not ever do this. And uh, in, in this case, of course, that was the part of the, uh, the, the, the very nature of the ritual itself was that it had to be held in a cemetery. So this is all over Eastern Europe. We find this ritual taking place. We also find it in the, a few episodes of it in uh, the land of Israel. So Ottoman Palestine, essentially late 19th, early, uh, early 20th century. And it makes its way to North America as well. So there's three that I know of in North America that, had, that take place in Philadelphia, Brooklyn, and Winnipeg. Those are the ones that I know of. Um, but generally, it was, it was focused on, uh, on Eastern Europe. And so what I want to do in, in the next few minutes is advance some possible explanations for why this very, very peculiar ritual takes place. Um, by the way, at the time, and when, it, when it's uh, most widespread in Eastern Europe, starting in the 1860s or so, Generally, you, we hear in the accounts of the cholera writing that people say this is a very, very old ritual, which is what people always say about rituals when they want other people to you know, adopt them. And the reality is that it's not a very old ritual. It probably emerged in the, in the 1830, I'll come back to that slide in a second, in the 1831 epidemic. So this is possibly some evidence as to the first cholera epidemic. Um, the, the source itself is from the 1890s but it refers to the cholera epi the epidemic of 1831, which came to the town of Rimanov, and they carried out the known remedy of marrying a poor man to a poor maiden in the cemetery. So this is obviously very, very terse, 
Most of the, the early references to the, to the collar wedding are very brief references, and it's not till the 1860s, because at that time we, start, we already have a Hebrew press and a Yiddish press that you can start to hear longer accounts of, um, of the, the collar wedding at that time. So the usual explanation that was advanced is that this is a great charitable deed because you're marrying off two people who would otherwise never be married. And so therefore, this is one way to, uh, to kind of appease the divine wrath during a time of, uh, of great evil or of, of great harm to the community. Uh, there's another possibility uh, that traces its way back all the way to medieval Ashkenaz, to the, the Jews of medieval Germany, that the idea that an orphan's prayer is particularly efficacious, and very often in those communities, an orphan would be asked to, uh, to recite or to lead certain prayers in the community because it was understood that the orphan was served as a kind of a bridge between this world and the next world. And there are many elements within the cholera wedding of this symbolism or the idea, let's say anthropologically speaking, of a bridge or some kind of liminal space between two worlds. So we could posit that this, the cemetery is chosen as the place for the cholera wedding because it's obviously it's the place of the dead. And when the living come to celebrate a, a ceremony which is itself a kind of life begetting ceremony, which is a wedding, it's in a way, warding off the power of the, the, the realm of dead to come any closer or to encroach any further into the realm of the living. That's one possible uh, explanation. It was also a very, very, uh, very hoary tradition among Jews, as among other peoples as well, to go to the cemetery to pray. And in fact, to, these were essentially intercessionary prayers, which asked the, the ancestors to intercede on their behalf, which rabbis usually forbade. They said, you cannot do this. This is not okay according to Jewish normative Jewish law, but Jews did it anyway because it was part of their tradition. So a, a couple other possible explanations. Um, and for this one, I want to read to you first this uh, explanation from a book called Sefer HaMatamim, which is a book that a uh, book of customs a book that explains jewish customs it was written by a rabbi and what he wrote about the collar wedding is that everyone attends the wedding in the cemetery in a celebration of mass joy and music and much happiness to arouse happiness in the masses so that they not be sad which is a great danger in this matter so that they not be afraid and become accustomed to the cemetery and not fear death and it was pretty, a pretty widespread assumption, understanding in the 19th century that if you were depressed, if you were afraid of the epidemic, that you were more susceptible to it, which is, has some logic to it, right? I mean, in terms of what we know about mental health uh, and our own experience during the pandemic, that it's, it's kind of important to keep your spirits up because it's easy to, to get depressed at a time like that. Uh, and there, in fact, were various uh, episodes across Europe where people engaged in some sort of carnival behavior it seemingly as a way to ward off the um, the malaise that the, or the anomie that the um, that the pandemic could bring about uh, and the fear as well so possible maybe this is an explanation for the collar rating it was it certainly had that character of a carnival or a fair uh, at least in some of the descriptions. So maybe this, and according to this rabbi, this was actually one of the goals. The goal was to bring people up to make them happier because a wedding is, a, is an occasion for happiness. Another possibility is that there's a, there might be a precursor of some kind to the actual historical collar wedding in Jewish culture. And that I find in a Purimspiel, which is a, a, a folk play, a folk drama that would be held on the, the carnival holiday of Purim. And this particular Purim spiel is called The Beggar's Farce, and it circulated pretty widely in Eastern and Central Europe in the early modern period and was apparently still being played in the 19th century. And this is otherwise called, another name for it is The Beggar's Wedding. So it's kind of a, a parody of the wedding of two beggars. The, during the entire play, the beggars are, or the people dressed up as beggars, are being made fun of. 
by the play itself and presumably by everyone who is watching, uh, who's laughing at their expense. Uh, and I'm, I've just given you on this and the following slide a few excerpts from the, uh, from the actual text of the Purimspiel itself, so you can get a sense of how, both how the beggars are, um, are treated in the Purimspiel, and also, you'll, as you'll see on the next slide, we'll see a very, very important theme that emerges from the Purimspiel itself. So there's an old grandfather who's addressing the beggar couple, and he says, um, congratulations, these are the, the terms of the, of the, in other words, the engagement terms, and all of the, everything that follows is essentially a series of insults. You're both totally ignorant Jews, these are the garments, so in other words, this is kind of what would ordinarily be an explanation of what the conditions of the engagement are. The garments are nothing at all. The dowry is 450 score demons, lodging in the poorhouse and the hektesh, which is another theme in my book that I devote a lot of attention to because the hektesh was another place where all of these different categories of outcasts gathered um, or were gathered. They were put there by the community very often. Maintenance is begging door to door and the, your position is at the cemetery because that was the be one of the best places to beg because people would give charity at the cemetery. Uh, and all is valid and binding. Oh, by the way, the image on the lower left is of Yitzchak Schipper, who was a, uh, a scholar of Jewish studies in Poland, who wrote, among many other works, who wrote a history of Jewish uh, drama, which is where I found this particular uh, Purim spiel. And then you have the wedding ceremony itself in the, this beggar's wedding. And there's a play here on the, the famous phrase in the Jewish wedding ceremony, Hareat mekudeshesli betabas zukadas Moshe Yisrael. By this ring you are, you are, you are, what is the word? Consecrated, Consecrated thank you. Consecrated to me. So the, the whole point of it is that there's various intertexts here with the Hebrew words of that phrase that, again, provide more and more insults. Uh, and you can see what they are. I'm not going to read all of them. You can see uh, you two blemishes, on you a plague, and on, you, on the lout your, your groom two plagues. Uh, may the lout burn like straw. May you both be bitten by the cat. Okay, and so on and so forth. And then at the very end, Kadas Moshe Yisrael. And in, uh, in Yiddish it says, A kapora zaltir veren farmir un far kol Yisrael. May you both be punished. So there's different ways to translate this. A kapora zolt irverin, the most important phrase here, or the most important word is kapore, instead of me and the whole Jewish people. And essentially what that means is, uh, may you serve as a scapegoat, may you serve as a substitute, right, for, um, for me and the entire Jewish people. And this is the theme that I want to uh, draw out a little bit because I think that one of the most important things that's going on in the cholera wedding itself is that symbolically the Jewish community is transferring the cholera from the entire community onto this one couple. Uh, and we have other evidence for that as well. In many cultures, of course, marginalized people serve as a scapegoat of some kind or another. Uh, I have a lot more uh, evidence for this in the book, but I'm just kind of talking in, um, in uh, abbreviations right now in, in a way. We have the Purim spiel that we just saw, where we, we saw that term a kapora, a, a substitute or a scapegoat. Um, another really important um, episode in Russian Jewish history is the episode of the conscription of Jewish men under Nicholas I, which some of you may be familiar with, which was a, a very tragic episode in, uh, in Jewish history when uh, boys, usually between the age of 10 and maybe 15, were drafted into the, the Tsarist army for very, very long periods of time. And there's a folk song that we, we have from that period, which is approximately 1827 to 1855, uh, that refers to the only child who's drafted into the army as a scapegoat, using that same term, kapore. And, and I have the, the folk song here, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it is a conscription lament, es essentially. Uh, and it's, uh, it's 
Terribly, terribly sad. Tears flow in the streets. One could wash oneself in children's blood. They drag these little chicks, these little boys from Cheder, from their religious school, and they dress them in military uniforms. Then there's a few lines about how the organized Jewish community, the leadership, actually assisted in this kind of conscription, uh, which is also a complicated story. And the most important thing here is that the Zusha Rakover, who's a in this song, understood to be a prosperous man, has seven sons, not one of them was drafted because he knew how to pay off. But Leah the widow's only son is made to pay the price for the sins of the kahal, the sins of the organized Jewish community. And another way to translate that, he's a scapegoat for the treachery of the kahal. He, it is a kapore, right? The same word, kapore, for kol zind. So there too we have the theme of the outcast, the marginalized, serving as a... Uh, a substitute or made to bear the, the, the brunt of the suffering for the entire community. So I'm arguing that, uh, among other explanations, of course, uh, because this is a very, very rich, I mean, a very problematic ritual, yes, but also a very rich, anthropologically speaking, again, ritual that has a lot of different layers to it. Um, and one of these layers is this element of scapegoat, where the bride and the groom are functioning symbolically as substitute victims for the epidemic. And this also fits very nicely into my larger, my larger argument in the book, which is that these Jewish outcasts actually come to serve starting in the 1890s or so, as, or, and in some ways even earlier, they serve as a, a symbol for East European Jewry as a whole. Uh, in earlier decades, let's say mid 19th century, uh, many especially progressive uh, let's say bourgeois East European Jews are quite worried about these outcasts, about these marginal people, especially beggars, especially poor orphans, because they seem to present a very ugly face to the outside world. And they want to solve the problem of these outcasts because they make the Jewish community as a whole look bad, to put it very bluntly. Uh, and sometimes we even get the sense that they just want to make the problem go away. Later on, with the rise of Jewish politics, modern Jewish politics, there's a, a way, a sense in which these outcasts, or at least this, the symbol of the outcast, is seized upon uh, in a very, uh, in a very, a triumphal is not quite the word, but uh, they're, they're mobilizing this, this symbol to use it for uh, political purposes. In other words, the, um, the beggar is the symbol of the suffering Jewish people as a whole. And so we're going to talk a lot more about the Jewish beggar. We're going to even um, put the Jewish beggar into novels and plays and films, which you can see all over the place, especially in the 1920s and the 1930s. That doesn't, of course, necessarily mean that these outcasts are treated any better in reality. Uh, by the Jewish community, although there is so, there is some um, there is some uh, movement in the interwar period to provide greater welfare support for such people, although the, it's it's difficult to do because the problem has gotten so bad by that point. Um, but in this later, let's say, 19 teens to 1930s, uh, in this period. This is what we might call, the, to some extent, the redemption of the marginal figure, where, for example, as you can see in the movie The Light Ahead from 1937, this was a Yiddish film called Fischke der Krumer in Yiddish, which is based on a popular Yiddish novel by the Yiddish writer uh, Mendel Macher Sfarim. And here you can see Fischke, who is the protagonist on the left, he's Fishka the Cripple, that's how he's, how he's known at the time. And his love interest is Hodel, who is blind. Now, in an earlier era of Jewish history, they would have been pitied, they would have been put into the hekdesh, into the poorhouse. Uh, there would have been uh, pretty negative attitudes towards Fishka and Hodel. By the time you get to, the, to 1937, when this film is made, they are, well, you can see, they're, they're played by the two, two of the most beautiful actors on the Yiddish stage at the time, on the Yiddish silver screen, uh, and they are truly the heroes of this story. And the villains of the story are the 
functionaries of the kahal, of the organized Jewish community, who, want, who decide that they're going to marry them off in a call or a wedding. But Fishka and Hodel, they, uh, they managed to outwit those folks because the kahal functionaries don't know that Fishka and Hodel are actually in love. So the joke's on them, right? The joke's on the leadership, and Fishka and Hodel actually, they go through the wedding, and then they, they, make, they make their escape. So there's actually a scene in the film where people are going, where'd they go, where'd they go? Because everyone was celebrating one second in the cemetery, of course, among the gravestones, and the next second, Fishka and Hodel have gone because they are headed out of town. They're going to either, either to the United States or to the land of Israel. It's not made clear which one, but what's, what's very clear is that they are the heroes of this story, and they represent the oppressed Jewish people, which is escaping its former conditions of, um, of uh, oppression and denigration. So they really have, uh, they really have the last laugh. Uh, we, we have another five minutes or so, right? Okay, so... Since I've come this far, I'm going to try to show you a clip from the wedding. I mean, from the, from the, from the film, yes. And hopefully uh, it will work out in terms, of the, um, in terms of the sound. So I'm going to switch to, the, to this. And this is the scene where, uh, where the shamus, uh, the... Uh, well, how would we say Shamus? The, the, um, yeah, I suppose Sexton, right. <laughs> uh, the beetle, right. The beetle of the community comes to gather, comes to get uh, Fishke and bring him to the, uh, to the leader of the community. Uh, of course, it went back to, uh, went back to where it shouldn't be. Let me go back to the... Uh, Okay, I think we're good. Wir machen der Hafen mit aller Verschiedenheit. Wir stellen der Krippe auf den Bezäulen. Im Betriebe wird ihm Gott helfen, in stillen Sandschau. Aber hat mich mich gerade nur auf den Bezäulen, sie zwischen alle Mäßen. Für die Gune stellen Fischke, Stut oder so überschlossen. Und wo sei Stut oder überschlossen? Mich hat er nicht gefreut. <lacht> Nun fragen wir nach Hitze. Mein Anzahl ist... Nein. Wo ist der Hagen und Arabe? Die Stutt wird dir geben, was schön im Nagen, Chassene Matunes, Alatische Jüdische Tochter. Wo ist der Hagen und Arabe? Die Buche glatt an Säu. Wo ist der Tachle? Sogar allein, Fischke? Wer ist das Mädel? Amal, Amal. Okay, so that's the, 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 the you saw the part where he's being told you have to marry Hodel, the, and they laugh because she's a blind orphan, and they figure this is so such a joke on him, but actually he's the one who actually does want to marry Hudel. And then the second piece that I want to show you is the wedding itself and then how the whole thing ends.
She says, where's the bride? Where's the groom? This is the kind bookseller who's helped them escape the cholera wedding and is helping get them free to freedom. You see, so we all understand that that Hudel actually is the one who sees, really, right? Even though she's blind, and it's the people who are in the the superstitious shtetl who are really not seeing the uh, the beauty of that that's really you know, inside these young people. Uh, and so that's a really, uh, it's a beautiful transformation of the, the theme of the outcasts. Um, but in reality, reality, the, the cholera wedding continued to be carried out uh, in, the, in the 1920s, uh, kind of petered out uh, by the mid-1920s or so. I think 1925 is the last one we have before the Holocaust. And then there are a few that are, that are actually carried out during the Holocaust itself when there's terrible epidemic outbreaks, of course, uh, in, in various cities and, and ghettos. Um, and you might have thought that that would have been the last time we would ever see the collar wedding, but we saw a COVID-19 wedding in B'nai Brak in March of 2020, right after the, the outbreak of the pandemic. Uh, at that time, I thought maybe we were on our way to seeing a lot more of them, but this is the only one that I've heard of so far. But it's still, I think, significant that it came back. Uh, it's, I, if you ask me, it's the kind of uh, deep-seated ritual which is, has, has great power in the kind of subconscious of the people. And these kind of powerful rituals don't just end. And I, I think it's probably not the last time we'll have seen the collar wedding in some form or another. Um, obviously, I hope we don't have any kind of pandemic again in our lifetimes. But um, the, the wedding has been around, this wedding has been around for a long time. And, and I, I have a feeling it'll make some sort of comeback at some point. So thank you for your uh, attention. And I look forward to your questions. So I think we can just open the floor and you can uh, be in charge of your, your questions. So who would like to go first? Yes, please. No. Um, thank you. This, is, this was really great. Maybe uh, afterwards I'll tell you a story about cholera and my great great grandfather uh, who uh, has a family story about a cholera epidemic. Uh, but it doesn't involve a wedding. Um, but uh, I, I was thinking of something you said about the, um, the way in which Representation. 
depictions of Jewish life in the Shetta more broadly. And I, I was thinking about um, like the photographs of Roman Bishan and the kind of portraits of these like, you know, very dirty and poor and, and, and crowded uh, shuttles that, that kind of framed, you know, things, things that were in the picture and things that were not in the picture. And I, I'm wondering if you could talk about the visual representations of the cholera wedding. Do we have, I mean, I, I, the, the painting that you showed mm -hmm. the later, you know, kind of a reminiscence. Yeah. Um, you know, do we have period representations? Do we have photographs? But I, I see the black chuppah in, the photo, in his photograph. I think I've seen it in an earlier photo. What, what are some of the visual ways mm -hmm. this, this ritual gets portrayed? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, so I, did, I didn't actually make any mention of these, of these illustrations, but there is this, uh, this painting here, which was, of course, done much, much later. And as far as I remember, Meyer Kirschenblatt, who did these paintings, didn't actually ever go to, he didn't attend one himself, a collar wedding. I think it was something that was kind of in the folk memory of his town or someone had told him about. And then there was this one here, uh, which was also done later on by someone who had grown up in Eastern Europe and left it for, um, for Israel, actually. And this was one of the memories that he had painted later. So, and I think generally those are the representations that we have of the call writing. They're mostly from memory. Uh, I, the only one that I've come, I came across, I think there was one photograph in a Yisker book and a memorial book that was of one of the Holocaust era weddings that I mentioned. But uh, as all of the previous ones, even the ones that were relatively late, let's say in the, the 1920s, I don't think we have any, any uh, contemporaneous representation of those at all. Um, and it, you know, it's a, it's, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult subject to get a hold of because a lot of the, a lot of the descriptions are tendentious in some way or another. Um, you know, either to one side or the other. So very often the descriptions in the Jewish press in the 1860s and 70s, for example, are inveighing against this because the writers are mostly muscillic and they feel that this is, a, this is a horrible superstitious act that people are carrying out. So whether or not they describe it accurately, right? I mean, so I, I try to gather as much evidence as I could, of course, but, um, but no, there really isn't very much that we have in terms of the the, the, the visual representation of it. Yeah. Uh, okay, yes, here in the front. I, I guess you're connected, so you decide which one will ask a question. <laughs> she's going to ask my question. Oh, she's going to ask your question, okay. Anyway, I was just wondering whether you think that this was an extension of the goat for Azazel sending it out, you know, a representation, you know, it's changed. Right, right. So the question is about the, whether this is an extension of the, the biblical ritual of the, uh, the, the goat upon whom, upon which the sins of the community are heaped and then it's sent off into the wilderness. And, uh, and the, the, I believe the word, is, the word kapara is used there as well, if I'm not mistaken. And anyway, it's all about the ritual of Yom Kippurim. I mean, it's all about that, that, that no, the, the operative... Um, Shorish there, the Hebrew root is the same. And I, I don't know if it's an extension per se, but I do think that there is a tendency in most cultures to want to, to need to create some sort of scapegoat, whether it's a ritual scapegoat or a communal scapegoat of some kind, as in this case. I read about, when I was doing my research for the book, I read about a very interesting ritual in ancient Greece where uh, where one or two people were made the scapegoat for the community's uh, ills, especially during a time of epidemic. And according to one account, they're thrown off a cliff. According to another account, they weren't actually thrown off a cliff, but, but, but they were in some way ritually denigrated. So th th there's evidence that this kind of thing happens in various cultures. I don't think there's a through line you know, in, Ju in Jewish history or in, in Judaism that you can actually draw from one to the other, but I think that, that, there, that the idea is there. The idea is there and the need is there, exactly, right. Uh, maybe I'll go to someone else and then come back to you. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. I'm just curious, maybe there was a range of Were those who were married, the victims of marriages, were they, was this always a coerced act? 
for some of the agreeable to this? Or is there a great way? Yeah, that's actually a great question that I didn't cover. Uh, I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Yeah, it's, it's a, the question is about whether the the brides and the grooms, the, as they were known, the collar brides and the collar grooms, were coerced into being a part of this ritual. Do we know much about them? And I didn't talk much about that, which um, which I probably should have, but I'm glad you brought it up. So, as far as we know, it was coerced. It was always coerced because. And we have accounts of these people saying, we don't want to do this. And the community said, well, you don't really have a choice. And in some of the, let's say, more literary accounts, which probably reflect the reality, the organizers often say to them, um, you know, we, the community has supported you all these years. Now's, now's payback time, right? We need you. And uh, so it's hard, it seems hard to believe that they ever would have willingly agreed to it. Even if, in theory, yes, it's a wonderful mitzvah and they would get married even though they, but they were being married to someone else who was considered to be like them, you know, we might say a freak like them or some, something along those lines. And as you saw in the film, she says, now nobody will laugh at us all the time. We won't have the bear the shame of being the collar bride and the collar groom, which we know was the case, that those people were, see, they, were always, they always bore that shame. Um, and most of the time, at least when we hear about the, what happens to them after the wedding, which we don't often because that, nobody really cared much about what happened to them afterwards, but they, in some cases we hear that they continued, surprise, surprise, they continued to beg after the, after the wedding was, was over, even though in some cases they were promised by the community, we'll set you up, we'll give you a nice situation, but that didn't always happen. And so their ch children too continue to be beggars and to live in the same kind of, of situation. So it was, it's, um, uh, it's, it's a difficult, yeah, it's a very problematic and I would say painful episode in, in the history of Jewish ritual. Yeah. Um, okay, in the back, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. You know, and all of these burials, and then, you know, and then the, you know, and then there's this wedding, and what that looked like. Can you speak a bit to the timing and the frequency? I mean, I noticed that 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 cholera wedding that you, you wrote that you, that you shared was on March 18th of 2020. That was early on. Before yeah. There, that was the, there was fear at that point. Nobody knew how it was transmitted or anything. So can you speak a little bit to the timing and frequency? Of Mm -hmm. Right, the timing and the frequency of the weddings. So normally the wedding was understood to be a last resort. So it wasn't something that you would do right away as soon as you knew that cholera was on its way. There were other things you could do in that case, and there were many things that, that many kinds of, of uh, remedies and, and policies that, that Jewish communities could put into place. Oh, and by the way, you, you're giving me an opportunity to come back to the theme that I actually didn't pick up on again, which is the poor revolting against the, against the establishment, which imposes policies on it. And in, in many cases, the, Jewish, the organized Jewish community did organize cholera clinics, cholera hospitals. Uh, I mean, people still died, of course, right? But there were, there were kind of organized approaches to what to do. There were doctors. This was organized from the grassroots, right? And often we hear not always, but often we hear that the women, the, the people, I just gave myself away, the people who are organizing the wedding are usually older women because they're known as the ritual experts. And in some cases, the local rabbis say, please don't do this. And the community says, we're doing this because this is an age-old ritual and this is what we need to do. So it happens usually as the, as the epidemic has progressed. Uh, I would say, I mean, in terms of timing, I'm not really sure, but it might be a few weeks in, something like that. Um, and there was, as far as I know, there was only one per community, right? So you would have the wedding and then, I mean, eventually an epidemic is going to peter out, right? As we know. So it does. And then people say, well, it was because of the, because of the cholera wedding, if they, if they want to say that. Um, 
I don't really have, a, I've never really had a good sense of, of how it spreads. I tried to map it. I tried to kind of, I have a chart of all of the ones that I found in all of the different historical sources. They're pretty much all over the map in terms of, of Jewish Eastern Europe. And I don't have a really good sense of, because, you know, many of them we don't have any evidence on at all. So it, that part is really hard to say. Um, but it was, it was very widespread, and it comes, as I said, it comes back over and over again. So the 1860s, and then in the, again in the 1890s, and then, I didn't mention this, but again, good opportunity to say it, that even when we're not talking about cholera, so the, the 1918 influenza pandemic, we also see them then, and then uh, cholera seems to happen less often, but then there's typhus sometimes, and then another one. So it, it can happen, you know, it doesn't, I mean, the illness itself, right, the, the, the disease doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's really the fact that people feel threatened in a kind of um, corporate way, right? The entire community feels threatened. I'm going to come to that side in a second. Yes, sir, please. You may have answered my question now in your last remark. Okay. But I was going to ask about the attitude of the rabbis towards the practice, whether they were opposed to it or if they were fully engaged and were the texts of the wedding ceremony different than the regular texts? Okay, so about a question about rabbis and texts. So I'll answer the second part of the question first. The texts, as, as far as I know, were exactly the same. It was, it was basically just our standard Jewish wedding ceremony. Um, my, what I lay, the structure that I lay out in the book, which is a little bit schematic, but I think it's correct, is that in the earlier, let's say the earlier generation of the cholera wedding, so let's say 1860s, there was rabbinic opposition to it, and as well as opposition from communal elders who, who said, again, as I said before, stop, don't do this, this will misrepresent the community, it looks bad for us, this doesn't work. You know, rabbis would say, Min hakshtus, this is a, a, a foolish custom. But then, a generation later, um, you find more and more rabbis who are uh, either carrying, out the, carrying it out themselves, who are involved in some way in some of the initial phases of deciding that this is going to happen, or writing uh, various kinds of apologetics to explain why the ritual is a kosher one. So it seems that somehow or other the, the rabbinic establishment ultimately had, had to accept the ritual because it was so widespread. We know that's true for many other folk rituals as well in Judaism, that, that rabbis ultimately have no choice but to accept the verdict of the masses. Yes, please. Yeah. remember, especially one of my uncles, uh, anytime something catastrophic would happen, he'd go, oh yeah, Hilaria. Mm -hmm. Somebody else, grow up with that, you did. And I didn't know what Hilaria was until I, you know, finally one day I asked, you know, what's a Hilaria? Oh, the cholera. Didn't know what cholera was even. So, but it, I remember, if a catastrophe happened, oh yeah, Hilaria. That was a number one. Number two, getting back to it, question as to who would be the bride or groom. Okay. My grandfather, blessed memory, was an orphan. He was raised, we were told, by some relatives who treated him very badly. And he was born in, nobody knows quite when because he was an orphan, somewhere around 1878 or 79, somewhere in there. And the story that came down to me was that he, he was from the Lomza uh, Bialystok area. Mm -hmm. And uh, that he was going to be, uh, found out that he was going to be drafted into the Tsar's army, and so he fled. Right. So my question is, the dates that you gave for the dates of being uh, conscripted don't fall that late into uh, the uh, 19th century. No. So that was a myth then. That was a, a story, a Zeta myself. No, not necessarily. Uh, so the, the question is about um, the, whether or not an, an orphan who was born around the late, 19th, the late 1870s could have 
fled Tsarist Russia because of the draft? The answer is yes, but it wasn't the same draft that I talked about. So this is a common question I get because in um, contemporary Jewish historical memory, all of the drafts in, in Tsarist Russia are kind of, they kind of collapse into one. Whereas the, the really, really severe, um, you know, tragic draft regime that I mentioned before under Nicholas I, where the boys were often taken away at a very young age, and then only once they turned 18 did they serve the 25-year term in the Russian army, that ended in 1855. So starting in the 1870s, the Russian Empire introduced universal conscription, which was usually done by, by lottery. And so if it landed on you, then you had to serve for three years. It was not a 25-year term. But a lot of Jewish men didn't want to serve anyway because it was the Tsarist army. And so they, so they ended up fleeing. So it was definitely possible that he did flee because of that, just not from the 25-year sentence, from the 25-year you know, uh, service term of service. And the, the first, I just want to repeat for the, for the recording, the, the reminiscence that you, that you gave, which is that in your home growing up, people use the term a halaria for a catastrophe, which is, yeah, which has to, exactly tied with the, the cholera pandemic, which were, of course, catastrophes in the 19th century. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take one last question. Rabbi? Uh, two totally unrelated Mm -hmm. um, is there any way that the circling of a wedding is tied to this? Or told not, not a chance? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> the circling of a wedding. I mean, I would say any, any religious ritual where there's circling, we have to question whether or not it's, supposed to, it's connected in some way to a magic circle. I mean, look, you know, those people who study religion for a living... I'm not sure if I count myself as one of them. Maybe I do. But we tend to say that there's always going to be multiple explanations for any given ritual, right? So we have the, the kind of traditional, let's say, rabbinic explanations for why something is done. Um, at dinner tonight, we were talking about the, the, the breaking of the glass underneath the chuppah, which we know what the traditional explanation is, has to do with the, the mourning for the temple. And then there's the folk, ex the, the, the folk meaning, which is to drive away the demons at a time of vulnerability. And so the, the circling under the chuppah, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's a magic circle, because um, usually magic circle has to do with protection, but I'm sure there's some way we could, we could connect it to it. Yeah, it's possible. Uh, very not related question. Uh, from your studying of uh, responses to a pandemic, was there anything that shocked you during the response to COVID? Anything that shocked me during the response to COVID? <laughs> Is there anything that didn't shock me during, during COVID? I mean, it's funny because you know how it is. I don't know if, how it is for all of you, but when I think about COVID now, it seems like a different... I mean, I know we're all dealing with the after effects of it, but it seems like a different lifetime. Like when we just stayed at home all the time and my kid went to school in front of a screen. I mean, it just... Um, so it, it was all very eerie having just studied that just written a book about this, or at least in part about this, and then to read about all these quack cures that people were talking about, that, that you know, the bleach and, and, and other, 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 and no, none of it really surprised me that much because, um, because I knew what the fear was like. And when you know what the fear is like, then you feel like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try, right? I mean, I was scrubbing down my groceries with, with bleach, like, like many of us were when I came home from the supermarket. And we know, like, I laugh at it now, but it wasn't, it wasn't a laughing matter then. It was really, you know, so no, I don't think anything really surprised me. Um, and I, there's one thing, one more thing that I wanted to say, going back to Noam's first question that I, that I forgot to mention. You said that you saw a black a black chuppah, a black canopy, and that's, that's correct, that sometimes in these weddings they specifically used a black, black cloth for the, for the canopy. I guess it was supposed to be appropriate for the cemetery setting, and sometimes it was called a schwarze chasana, sometimes it was called the black wedding, in addition to being called the magefa chasana, which is the, the pandemic or epidemic wedding. I think that was supposed to be the last question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.